Oh, Dixon interview. Yeah, this really good interview with Dixon. That I don't think I'm not sure if it's new. It's it, it, I saw it on Sense. I'm pretty sure it's not new. Um, um, S Essence or Essence is really popular. Oh, what's happened here? Why is that link not working? Oh, that's why. So, um, uh, Sense is a really popular um, Montreal. I think no Canadian based online men's retail. I think it's Montreal. I'm not too sure. I'm not gonna be. I'm gonna be honest. But they do really good editorials, like for an online store. Like they've smashed it. Like they really do really, really good editorials. Really good shoots and editorials. Um, and they did one um with Dixon that I highly recommend you check out. It's really, really amazing, really illuminating um expose on him. He talks about his love of fashion, his approach to DJing. I've got it up here on the screen for some of you guys to see. And yeah, Dixon's just one of my favorite DJs coming up overall. Um his aesthetic overall is very interesting. The way they do parties, his limited releases, his kind of like anti-celebrity, anti-spreading himself to thin ethos. Um, you know, like, and I just loved um, the whole, you know, that whole era where he was kind of, where he, I think he won RA DJ of the Year three times back to back, right? And I just loved hearing him talk about that whole turmoil he was going through about, you know, having to deal with the fact that he had to kind of live up to the reputation of being, you know, known as one of the best DJs in the world and kind of fighting against it and it was a very interesting time to kind of because that was also during a time when EDM DJs you know like um what's his name uh people or well, the guy that throws a uh, cake in people's faces and shit there was a lot of like celebrity culture attached with DJing and he was really kind of he was really, he was really at odds with it right because there's so much opportunity there right for him to kind of set his family up for life in, in general right by going on tour and making money on the road but then it's also kind of that idea that your that your artistry or your work is kind of suffering because you're spreading yourself too thin and I loved kind of hearing him speak really candidly about how he kind of approached it and there's loads of really interesting um uh tidbits on here that i really recommend you check out these hair and preston jeans are quite nice aren't they I, again they're not for me probably not something i would wear but seeing how seeing dixon wearing them in, in irl like the hair and preston jeans are like you know the, the denims with the kind of um the orange sort of like a uh, sticker tape sort of like motif on the low on the lower half of the leg and the top half of the leg they're quite they're not not too bad um yeah but i recommend you check it out it's a really really interesting interview i'm going to click i want to attach the link on there in the show notes so you can basically check it out um but yeah overall i think it's cool and there's a real what's a what's a real bit here uh, i liked as well yeah here's a bit i liked as well uh, so he says here um so the question the interview asked him so you see yourself as and this interview too is really cool he did really good questions um he really pro prong uh, probed uh dixon and got some really good answers out of him so it says here, um, so you see yourself as a DJ, not as a musician. Um, and Dixon answers, I put out a lot of music, but I do not see myself as a gifted musician. I'm a very good DJ, period. Is DJ a service provider? People go to club because they want to have fun. Music is only part of the experience. It has to be, it has to do with the special situation. The other people. I didn't stumble into clubs in the early 90s because I was fascinated with techno. I was fascinated with other people, which is something that I've kind of always spoken, I've always kind of thought about my kind of infatuation with nightlife culture. A lot of it has to do with the music. A lot of it has to do with the cities that the clubs are, are situated. A lot of it has to do with the clubs itself. A lot of it has to do with the kind of the business side of the like, nighttime industry, which I'm really interested in, which is, you know, might be a good website, you know, the business of clubbing or something along those kind of lines, right? But what I really like about nightlife culture is the people, right? Is the idea that different parties you go to, you see such a wide swath of the population all kind of, you know, dancing and celebrating under these dimly lit lights, right? Um, you don't know anyone's socioeconomic position, you don't know anyone's race, race, color, you don't know anyone's kind of sexual orientation or whatever it may be, right? You're all kind of in this weird, like, dark, enclosed space and you're kind of sharing this kind of shared moment, this sort of like shared ecstasy amongst each other. That's something that really captivated me a lot and I'm glad he kind of spoke on it. The interview continues and says, uh, the people, the excess, the going out as um, aspect, the colors, the clothes. I saw that, I can, I, I can even hear Dixon saying in his accent, his German accent. Um, I saw that it was another world and I wanted to be part of it. And at some point, the music came too. People want sex. It's part of the whole system. It's a mistake to think one person dominates everything with the music. What constitutes a perfect party to you? To get lost in the moment, of course, in a vision. Um, that is why we created Lost in the Moment Party. 
serious over the past few years, organizing parties in castles, in museums or an island outside of London. What we're doing is independent of location. We can do it in the most adverse circumstances. On an Ossia island outside of London, people had to bust um, people had been busted in the morning, but then a flood came, so there was no going back. You have to play in a context that are good for you. The smaller the crowd, the riskier you can be. When I play at a festival and make some crazy statement, people look at the clock and say, you know what, blah, blah, blah is playing over there, let's check it out. If I'm playing on an island, they can't get off of it. So artistic freedom is given, that's amazing, right? <laughs> Uh, with 25 years um club and culture experience all over the world behind you does this place does this space still work for you is it not thoroughly commercialized i think the last five years have been shown some interesting signs of life in our field electronic dance music berlin has always been the bell weather for what um will be happening everywhere later on uh we, what we experience what we've experienced here in recent years with the easy jet set with the easy jet set is a widespread phenomenon now. It, is, it isn't New York as I see when I go to New York, but people from Chicago, Montreal, Stockholm, music is part of this idea of experiencing two days of somewhere else on a relatively small budget. Actually, I just thought of something. What's that? You asked me um, at the beginning how it ca all came about with the DJ career. I've always moved between stores, so to speak. I was on the Sonar Collective label, but I wasn't with the key players. Before that, I was regularly playing at parties that were thrown by Alex M. Alex Empire from Atari Teenage Riot. I played a house set. Imagine him raw, man. Imagine him playing alongside Atari Teenage Riot. That would sound so weird, isn't it? Um, I played a house set during those the, one of those brutal industrial evenings, and it was clear I was doing it for the last time in that particular context. I didn't really fit in um, when I started playing in the legendary Berlin club, w, WMF, either. Um, it's absolutely amazing to play at Panorama Bar slash Berghain nowadays, but now nobody would say that I'm really part of it. I've felt like a misfit for a very long time in a negative sense, but at a certain point, I realized that it just means I have to do my own thing, and that is probably a strength. Since then, we've tried to apply this, um, everything we do at Innovision, starting our own label, our own record store, our own booking agency. I wanted to do it like Dries Van Noten. He was a role model for it. I love the idea, right? The idea that he was always a misfit. And through being a misfit, that's where he created his own opportunity in order to kind of succeed. Again, it's an amazing um, expose, amazing interview. I'm pretty sure it's uh, quite old, but I don't care. And I also like the fact that some of these um, websites, especially um, um, uh, this online retailer sense, they do this thing where they don't publish the date of the article. I think that's super important. I know... Um, Sometimes on my blog, I kind of try and publish dates or have an archive there so I can feel like I'm not doing anything because I want to blog every day, but I don't. If you look at the dates, you can see some of the numbers aren't illuminated blue. But sometimes people don't read stuff because it, it, it's, ah, it's, it was, he, re he, read, he read this last year. What does it matter? I think I remember Tim Ferriss doing the same thing in his blog. Um, there's no dates on their blog entries, just the entries themselves. So people just have to look at them and kind of search them themselves. So that's a really good idea. The kind of fact that it's just it's just content. It doesn't matter. It's just writing. I mean, it doesn't matter when I when I read this. It's still true to this day. It's like when you listen to um or when you read quotes from James Baldwin, right? The the well known intellectual public intellectual. Um, some of the stuff that he talks about in terms of race relations in the U.S. There are things that still apply nowadays, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you know you have to kind of throw it in a bin because it, you know churchill said it back then so yeah i love i love it i recommend you check it out um interview with dixon the world famous dj on scent right now